Well, thank you and good morning. And uh, I've certainly enjoyed Michael's company and the hospitality of everybody here. And I want to thank the sponsors for being here. So I'm going to start the conference off extremely badly by telling you that I'm not going to talk about subacute ruminal acidosis. So, you know, I guess, the, I guess this is where it starts and ends for the conference quality, doesn't it? So what I'm going to talk about rather is I am going to talk about ruminal acidotic conditions. And I think we're going to start a little bit by looking at uh, definitions because definitions have plagued this particular condition as they have of many of the metabolic conditions that affect cattle. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, a body of work that we've been doing over about 20 years and I want to thank people who've been involved in that body of work and particularly up here, uh, Liz Bramley, who did a PhD with me, Ahmed Rabvi, who was our research director, Pietro Celli, a great colleague who's now moved over to America and... Uh, my research director, Helen Golder, who did a PhD with me. So Helen's now with our company. The other person I really want to mention is this guy here, who's Rodney Blacker. Left school at about 16. He had been ducks of his primary school, but left at 16. And he's one of those rare individuals whose attention to detail makes all the difference if you want to do good quality studies. He's just a lovely man and very humble. And uh, so what I want to do first is talk about what is a case, because a lot of metabolic disease has been plagued by a lack of appropriate definition and understanding of what a case truly is. We're going to sort of talk about defining and diagnosing acidosis, talk about maybe clinical acidosis cases, but probably do that much more in the workshop. Talk about what role substrates have in acidosis and acidotic conditions and touch on the associated causal metagenome and genome. So I'm going to just touch on some of that work that works coming through right now. So the first thing is I think we need to think about these definitions of disease. They've often been historically based. For example, milk fever. Where's the fever? There is no fever, but it's milk fever, correct? So when you start to think about things like that, you know, grass tetany, a perceived etiology type condition, one of my favourites is enzootic marasmus. It just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? It doesn't mean that it means anything to me. I'm not sure what an enzootic marasmus is. But when you start thinking about these older definitions we've used of disease, they're extremely poor, extremely ill-defined, and what they do is cause confusion both in regard to prevention and even treatment. So what we're going to do is talk a little bit about how we classify disease. So the criteria for metabolic disease, I, I kind of reworked Evans' postulates, published those in a paper, 2009. And the first thing is that we need something that's defined, that's consistent with, our, uh, with the current understandings of the biology. I'm not going to go into the case control type aspects. There's a couple of case control criteria. But then I'm going to move on to prospective studies. Prospective studies should demonstrate that exposure to a putative cause increases the risk of that disorder or increases that disorder. There should be a spectrum of responses from mild to severe, which should occur along a logical biological gradient. We should have measurable changes in metabolism that result from exposure to a putative cause and we should see that removal or modification of the exposure should change the disorder. So we're going to go through a series of experiments that actually test most of these postulates so that we're going to start to understand, hopefully, acidosis kind of a little bit differently. So all relationships ultimately should be biologically and epidemiologically sound. In terms of the biology, this condition may be the most important disorder of dairy cattle, beef and sheep in feedlots and those that are intensively fed. So we think it's a damned important condition. It causes low milk production, low milk fat, low milk protein. And of course, it can have long-standing effects such as those of ruminitis and damage to the papillae such as shown in these um, photographs. Uh, we need to kind of examine the evidence, and this is some recent work we did, looking at the effect of supplement amounts, and these were 80% wheat concentrate or concentrate going up there, and looking at the response in very late lactation cows, you can see that as the amount of supplement increased, what we got was an increase in milk yield followed by a decrease in milk yield. So at the extreme level, we can start to see that milk yield drops off and fat drops off, and this is consistent with an acidotic model. So in other words, Acidosis or extreme exposure to carbohydrates in this case causes a drop-off in both milk and milk production. 
And what about the disease sequelae? So we know that the disease sequelae include things like lameness, they include paintbrush hemorrhages, they include weight loss, scouring, liver abscesses, and at its most dramatic, epistaxis, where cattle bleed out the mouth. And I don't know if you've ever seen a case, but it's pretty horrid as they stand there in front of you, bleed out the mouth and die. So fortunately, these things are rare, but they occur. Why, I guess, am I so interested in it is that in Australia, we have fairly unique feeding systems. We feed a lot of grain in a milking parlour as cows are fed, and those cows are exposed sometimes to inconsistent amounts of grain. Grain builds up in feeders, and then you find that the animals get unduly exposed. So we have a system that lends itself to risk of acidosis. So what is this acidosis? Well, some people have defined it as being a rumen pH of less than 5.8 to 6, and it's really far too simplistic. It's not really a good uh, categorization of this condition. So when we start thinking about it, there's a, a really important document that's just been produced out of the UK. It's kind of a manifesto of UK scientists. And what they're saying in this document is that they're saying, we've got to actually reject the use of pH as a way to define acidosis. We've got to think of different measures because it's not that diagnostic. And I'm going to show you evidence of that. I'm going to talk about other ways to diagnose acidosis. It's really a complex of conditions related to rapid change in the diet, rapidly fermentable carbohydrates, probably a lack of fibre, and it is an accumulation of organic acids that reduces microbial protein yield and fibre digestion. And critically, what does that mean? That means that in subclinical cases, it will result in less efficient production. So this is a production efficiency issue of some significance. Let's talk about the pathogenesis. And I know in the UK you often feed quite wet silages of very high quality, very low pH. So there is the potential for acid formation, strong acids, lactic acidosis, and sugars that are overwhelming. But you've also got, in many cases, a pre-existing dump of acid that comes from the silage which delivers preformed lactic acid. So the two together are not exactly a condition that allows for room and stability. We also have a condition where we've got increased weak acid production, the volatile fatty acids, particularly propionate, butyrate, acetate, and uh, to a lesser degree, valerate and others. And what they are able to do is change room and pH. And is this the legendary subacute ruminal acidosis? So when I think about that term, it's not a term I enjoy. So and I don't think I want to get into the philosophy of it, but bottom line is I think we've either got subclinical acidosis, one that has an impact on production that we can't detect readily, or we've got clinical acidosis, which is one in which we see evidence of clinical disease. I'm not sure what a subacute is. So remove all of the agents that control acid formation, and we do see this. We see this when you take out agents that are controlling the risk of acidosis, and then suddenly we go into a crisis. So that's, that's a reasonably important form. One of the things that would be lovely to discuss today, but we will avoid, is where does the problems of the clinical signs come from? Where do, they, where do you get these clinical signs? We've spent a fair bit of time looking at things like histamine, and that could be a significant player in terms of the clinical signs. We think that probably things like histamine, lipopolysaccharides, they're probably having an impact if we have a damaged gut. And if there's an allowance for increased absorption of these, perhaps then we're seeing vasoactive actions. And again, lactic acid itself is a vasoactive agent and quite capable when injected of causing changes consistent with laminitic change. So these things, we're not exactly clear. And under the circumstances of the room, and what we find is that lactic acid is generated probably at the same time as endotoxin, probably at the same time as histamine. And in the equine, there's a very elegant model showing that release of insulin also causes changes that can result in laminitis. So then we've also got the question of hindgut acidosis. So the hindgut may well play a role, and there's people such as Mary Beth Hall who have strong views on that, and they may well be valid. So, I think when you think about that, it's a reasonably complex situation. So what we need to do is drill down a little further and try to define it better. So the first thing is, why not pH? What's wrong with pH? 
Isn't it, isn't it just perfect? Well, the first thing is the rumen is not homogenous. pH is a poor predictor of acidosis in individual cattle. You know, for example, when we did the study that I'm going to show you where we looked at 800 cows across 100 herds, we were finding cows perfectly happy running around with rumen pHs of 4.5. These cows were apparently quite normal. So they're either subclinically acidosis, acidotic, or just normal with a particularly low rumen pH. What pH? What pH are we talking about? Are we talking about indwelling probes, and there's some excellent ones being developed, area under the curve which has been used, minimum, maximum, perhaps a ruminocentesis or a fistulate pH, or perhaps stomach tube. So all of these differ. And in fact, the pH differs with site in the rumen. And these sites are neither right nor wrong. There is no appropriate site. If you want pH of the rumen and you want to be really precise, you better evacuate the rumen, homogenise it, take the pH and stick it all back in. Because it's incredibly dynamic. The rumen moves, as you know, it contracts and it moves fluid around and that changes the pH within the rumen. So, again, there is no right nor wrong. These are just measures of rumen pH. They do differ. So if you take, for example, stomach tumour and ruminocentesis, what you can find is that in one very small study by Ken Nordland, you had a 1.1 difference in pH, which is really substantial. In the biggest of these studies, which was Liz Bramley's study uh, with me, um, and the figures published in the Journal of Dairy Science, what we found was about a 0.2 difference and an R squared of 0.47. So that's not too bad a fit. Ruminocentesis and fistula, again, modest size studies, but a difference of about 0.3 and reasonably good fits. And then stomach tube and fistula, about the same and a fit of about 0.58. So these things are quite moderately correlated. And when you look at Liz's data, what you can see is that you've got this vast array of, you know, responses. And these were taken within, you know, a very brief time of each other. So in other words, Liz was taking a ruminocentesis sample, then taking the stomach tube and then we were matching them up and you can see that they're pretty similar. In fact, it was the other way around. I think she usually took the stomach tube first and then the ruminocentesis. But you can see, as I said, there's cows with incredibly low pH just running around apparently normal in these herds. So, let's maybe think a little bit differently about the condition and let's now start to think about what's the primary goal in terms of the adaptive behaviour to handling the extra hydrogen that's generated in the rumen. So let's talk about some of the places that it can put it. So for example with starch, the protozoa actually play a reasonably important role in terms of ingesting starch granules and protecting them from ready degradation. So they slow the release. In terms of bacterial glycogen, that may be another significant store. It sequesters hydrogen, slows release and it's safe. If we think about the other places that it can be hidden, this is the big one. I think for me this is, this is huge. If you look at it, there's 55.8 grams of hydrogen per 100 grams of bacterial cells produced and methane is also produced. So what you've got is a great form of sequestration of the hydrogen into a really productive pool and of course that's putting it into microbial nitrogen. So bacterial production is a good one. If we look at the ones that are a bit more risky, of course, it's lactic acid. Why is lactic acid so bad? Well, it's 10 times more potent than the other volatile fatty acids in terms of lowering rumen pH. And this is why lactic acid is important. Yet in many studies, it's very hard to find much lactic acid in the rumen. So one of the things that I think is important to differentiate is that lactic acidosis is very different from an acidosis without that lactic acid being present in substantial amounts. They may be places on the same continuum of risk, but they may not be exactly the same condition to both monitor and manage. So lactic acid, it's very strong acid and it's problematic. So the other place, of course, is hiding it, and this is a rather good way to hide it as in uh, production of uh, uh, taking bicarbonate, producing water and carbon dioxide, and of course that's another good place to hide it. So, sugar, sugar behaves very dissimilarly to starch. Starch and sugar just not the same when they behave in the rumen. 
quite extraordinary. I'm going to show you the data in a little while. And it's a really profound difference in substrate when you start looking at the substrate. Just want to say, measures of pH are somewhat useful. It's just putting them into context and not saying that the whole of our definition should be driven around pH. But measures of pH have some use. Constant measures with indwelling probes and the new high quality options are good. Fistulates are not physiological and they have limited numbers, but again, they provide us with useful information. And both have limited capacity to relate to larger populations because the boluses are expensive and fistulates, damn hard to get through animal care and ethics now. Rumen pH differs with source of carbohydrate and here's just a difference. You know, isoenergetic diets, but very, very different rumen pH responses to the use of wheat versus sorghum, for example, grain. pH varies remarkably among cows on farms, and this is some data from Nick Johnson's group up at uh, University of Glasgow, and uh, thank Nick for the opportunity to use his data. But you can see that there's cows here with very different rumen pHs, very different patterns, and we're going to see some of the incredible animal variation that's expressed in ruminal behaviour a bit later. So we'll drill down on that. pH also varies with the time of day, and again, that's quite obvious from Nick's work. It is associated with feeding behaviour, but there is a variation throughout the day. And pH is clearly affected by diet, but these are extremely hard data. You can eyeball them and you can see something going on, but you try to analyse these and these are testing data to analyse. So when you start coming into it, interpretation of the findings is somewhat challenging. It's not to deny that these things are useful, it's just to say, hang on, we need to think very hard before we start hanging our hat on a single measure. So when we come into testing the postulates, we look at the Bramley work, and this was a study, basically, we wanted to define the condition, we wanted to look at the proportion of the cows with the disorder being exposed should be greater than the not exposed, and all those relationships should be biologically and epidemiological plausible. So that's what we were testing, and what we looked at was 800 cows, 100 herds, we looked at 5-8 older cows, we looked at 3-8 parity 1, we took random samples of herds with replacement from veterinary clinics five regions of Australia, and we looked at what ruminal measures would best diagnose acidosis. We didn't want to come in with an a priori definition, we wanted the data to talk to us, and we did not want to come with an a priori view of it, so we didn't want to be pejorative. And we wanted to use large numbers, our basic assumption being was that if stomach tube or ruminocentesis resulted in high levels of variance, then a reasonable sample size would help. So that's how we approached it. So what did we do in Liz's model? We looked at seven ruminal volatile fatty acids, we looked at rumen ammonia, rumen lactic acid and rumen pH. We looked at feed analysis data from the herds, health data from the herds, production data, and then we developed from that, we developed using these measures here, an acidosis score. And this is the factors that came up, and we used what's called a cluster analysis. A cluster analysis allows us to throw the data together and say, how many groups are they? Tell us about what these groups look like, and that's what we did. And interestingly, the things that came up as being highly significant were valerate, propionate, butyrate, isobutyrate, dropping down the list, and you know what's down the bottom? is D-lactate and pH. And they were the significant, but the second and last most useful measures. So they were not terribly useful. They were still very significant, but not terribly useful. And my first response was, what the hell is lactate, or uh, valerate? Why is valerate there? Well, if we have a look, though, at these groups and we see what those clusters looked like, we can see that rumen pH in cluster one is lower than clusters two and three. We can see that the propionate is much higher than clusters two and three. We can see that the valerate is much higher. The lactic acid, or the D-lactate, was higher. And the critical thing here is that the rumen ammonias were very low in this group. So this is a group that kind of the stats has kicked out for us to investigate. And of course, as I said, the valerate was very important. So, if we look at the production data for those particular herds, we can see that in fact cluster one, which contained 39 cows, 
had a milk volume that was in fact the highest, just marginally, but not significantly. It certainly had the lowest and significantly milk fat percentage. They had modestly similar milk protein percentage. They had fat to protein that was depressed. So the fat to protein ratio was significant to the depressed, but the yields of fat, the yields of protein, in fact, the yields of protein were probably the highest here. Fat was intermediate, in fact, it's the lowest. And then you can see that cell counts didn't differ. If we looked at the diets that came from herds with a high prevalence of these animals, what you can see is that the diets support an acidosis type model. The NDFs were lower than the others. The NFCs, the non-fibre carbohydrates, were higher than the others. The starches were higher than the others. And so you can see that those were the significant differences and again, quite marked. Also, of course, if you want to come back to metabolizable energy, the metabolizable energy was higher. So valerate and propionate are important. And as I said, my initial response was why valerate? What is valerate? So when we start to look at it, valerate is the major product of lactate. So it goes back to Stewart, 1957, some nice carbon labeled work. And essentially it shows that you take lactate, you add it to acetate, you put in four hydrogens and then you end up with valerate. So it is a pool where you move hydrogen ions across and sequester them into a safe place. And propionate is the same. So in fact, propionate is also a product, of course, of lactate. So this is moving lactic acid out of its dangerous position in the rumen into safer pools. So cluster one does fit an acidosis model. 10% of cows sampled, high dietary NFCs and starch, low NDF, low PE, physically effective NDF, high rumen volatile fatty acids, low rumen concentration in pH, indicates high rates of carbohydrate fermentation, results in high milk production, and critically, and this is critical, herds that had a high prevalence of acidotic cows under that category had 103% increased risk of lameness. So in other words, they had double the lameness of the other herds. So the evidence there now we need to think about, what does the continuum of risk look like? So let's talk about that. If we look at the continuum of risk, it may go from extremely low risk, where we've got high NDF, low starch, low sugars, healthy body tissues, and a stable diet, and particularly ruminal and intestinal absorptive tissues, and then we might go to a low NDF, high starch diet. And lastly, a low NDF, high starch, high sugar diet with damaged tissues. And it's interesting that retrospectively thinking about it, where we've seen really severe outbreaks of acidosis, including a lot of laminitis, are herds where we've had things like pestivirus in those herds as well. And of course, pestivirus damaging epithelial mucosa, allowing access to those toxins that might be produced. I guess the next thing we need to do is think about this continuum of risk and prove it. This is again published journal of Dairy Science, some of Helen Golder's work. And this is a study done in conjunction with the Victorian Department of Primary Industries. And what we've got is these groups. We've got control groups, which are fed in the milking parlour, going up to 16 kgs of uh, a, a supplement, of which 80% is wheat. And then you come down to a partial mix ration, which is identical, but puts it into a mix containing the fibre with the grain and taking much of it out of the milking parlour. And then we come down to a PMR plus protein. So that partial mix ration the same, but adding in some canola to kind of change the nature of the ration around. So then 24 cows, rumen fistulated, two cows per strategy rate, um, embedded in a much bigger study of about 100 and, uh, 180, maybe 240 cows, I think with the same adaptations and groups. Again, that's published in Journal of Dairy Science. Diet adaptation, eight, 19 days. Rumen samples were taken 10 periods over 24 hours. And what you can see is that using, I guess, eigenvalues that are spun out now, they're just a, a, a statistical measure that says whether something's you know, high on a scale or low on a scale, it's not a big deal. It's basically saying that if you've got an eigenvalue of one, you're in the heart of the acidotic group, you're acidotic. If you've got an eigenvalue at zero, you're not. So it's pretty simple scale, really. Big words, I guess, critically, zero, one, 
there's a continuum in between. You look at these cows on the 16 in the control group, you can see 100% of the cows there, and most of the day were acidotic. You can come down and there's a continuum of risk, down to the 14, down to the 12, down to the 10. What is really striking and very, very supportive of the more intensive feeding strategies worldwide goes back to the complete diet type work done in the UK. You know, there were some great workers here, Fred Gordon and others. And of course, you know, integrating these diets together into a partial mixed ration markedly reduces the risk of acidosis. So putting stuff together makes sense. Again, interestingly, adding protein in, bottom line, smacks it right down. Okay, so when you put protein in, you actually reduce the risk very substantially. So now let's come down to some of the practical stuff. You know, are all grains the same? I'm not going to go into the study design too far. I'm just going to say that basically it was about a seven-day pre-adaptation, you know, four days feeding them about one kg of mixed grain and then hitting them with about 1.2% of body weight of different grains. And this was a very big study, really, with 40 cows, a group and columns and four groups of 10. So you ended up being able to look at around these 20 grains, but looking at them with around, uh, I think it was four animals a group. And this data, obviously, with so many grains, is pretty hard to display. So what we're using is a little bit of a, a graphics method used by people who play on the stock market. So, you know, you're getting your stock market education today. What you do is just graph the thing over time this way. So time zero, which was just five minutes after they'd eaten their grain, goes to time one, about 45 minutes later, another hour later, hour later, and you can see that, for example, with this particular sorghum, rumen pH was initially high and plummeted, but if you come across to some of these triticales and wheats, what you can see is marked reductions with some of them in rumen pH over time. Interestingly, these rumen pHs don't plummet down into those very low ranges. There is enough buffering, enough help in the rumen for that rumen to remain reasonably stable, and particularly because we use stomach tube systems to take those samples because we want to do repeated measures. We don't want fistulates because they're not as physiological as normal animals. We don't want to do, uh, I guess, a ruminocentesis because we'd have repeated puncture. So we use a stomach tube, tends to give you that slightly higher rumen pH, but these animals are showing quite marked change. And the really critical thing I want to show you is that here's the differences in propionate over time, and you can see some of these grains just markedly differ, as you might expect. The oats, for example, doesn't show much change over time. Those grains aren't highly fermented. They're not high-energy grains by and large. Understand, though, that sometimes oats can have very high energy, but that energy is largely delivered from fats rather than from starches. But if we come into the group of triticales and wheats, you can start to see that these are really generating quite marked changes in propionate over a relatively short period of time. But what is truly quite remarkable is the change in valerate. The valerate is much more sensitive as a measure of what's going on in that room and in terms of acidosis risk than indeed even the propionate. And again, you can see the differentiation between those different grains. And here's oats too with virtually no change in the valerate versus some of these wheats, triticales, with massive changes over 300%. So this was then used to develop an NIR index to assess different grains for acidosis risk. And it's a really simple proposition. In terms of everyday experience, all grains are just not the same. Very, very simple. As you change grain, don't assume if you change from one corn to another, one wheat to another, one barley to another, or one triticale to another, that you have the same product. So you need to think about acidosis risk in terms of the different grains. If you look at rumen pH and the differences between the grains, rumen pH was not diagnostic. Propionate was diagnostic. Valerate was the most diagnostic, and importantly down here, ammonia is also diagnostic. I apologise for it dropping off the end. And we were able to develop an acidosis index, and I think that acidosis index is going to be used potentially in the UK, as I understand. So, if we look at this acidosis diagnosis, uh, 
Let's now start to turn this on our head and let's start to talk about how we might try to diagnose acidosis in the field. So if we start to look at these things, we can start to say, here's a number of things that we can do in terms of taking history, interpreting the disease that occurs on the farm, assessing the feed management practices, observations of clinical signs. We can look at milk fat, milk protein, rumen measures, blood measures, but a lot of these are at our disposal in the field and help us make good decisions about whether a herd is at high or low risk of acidosis because we've seen some of those characteristics. So we can look at the type of feed. Is it highly processed cereal grains? You know, corn less risk than wheat less risk in general than triticale, yeah, sorry, corn less risk than wheat and also you've got triticale less risk than wheat. So wheat tends to be the grain with the greatest risk associated with it. But again, you can get some barleys that cause spectacular risk of acidosis looking at that data that we showed. We find turnips give us a very, very large risk of acidosis. Why? Because they're particularly high in sugars. It's the sugars that constitute the risk. And again, large dumps of particularly lactic acid generated silages are really quite problematic at times. So, you know, particularly in California, experience problems with, with um, high moisture, corn, corn eelage, sometimes very, very difficult to keep rations stable with corn eelage in the diet. So rapid changes, look for the TMR form and whether they're sorting. And this is a farm we went to yesterday and we can see quite marked sorting of the grain occurring. So you can go in, start to have a look, see whether the cattle are eating the diet that's been given to them. Because in this case, they're rejecting a reasonable amount of some aspects of the diet. Look at the processing and look if you've got any controlling agents as to whether they're being delivered effectively. This is the front end and the back end of a feeding system. That's the back end of the feeding system on a cableway system that carries grain along a parallel parlour, takes it along, feeds it in front of the cows. You can see that all the feed additives and the fines are all in that one section. So you've got a problem there in terms of whether these animals are actually receiving the controlling agents you believe they're receiving. Of course you can look for scouring the herd in Northern California and you can just see, um, you know, really quite marked scouring just flowing out and again, when you start to work on that ration, you find that the NDF overall is extremely low. Paintbrush hemorrhages, evidence again of white line disease, problems here, there, of again, evidence of acidotic change. Just remember that the hoof changes occur a lot later than when the acute insult occurs. Laminitic rings. Very marked, you can see that there was a marked break here. This was associated with acute break, outbreak of laminitis in a herd and you can see that three months later you got clear evidence of that. You can use the locomotion scoring systems. Uh, they're well described, they're very handy to go through and see whether you've got a high prevalence of lameness. Again, good indication of at least insult in the past and possibly prevalent, uh, presently. So we've talked about the Estimates of, um, we've talked about the Bramley study, but when we look at this study, we found that about 10% of the cows in a reasonably, uh, a reasonably taken sample were acidotic at the time. And that is on a given day. So when you think about it, if the prevalence is 10%, what's the incidence? Well, when we looked at the Irish estimates, they're 11%. Lower on the Bramley model, they were, came out at 3%. US estimates, based on pH, Gary Etzel's work, looks at 28%. Other estimates around the world, similarly around these ranges. If we look at an estimating an incidence from the prevalence using some methods Ian DeHood developed, you find that 10% have, if it's 10% prevalence, you get 15 cases per lactation per cow, assuming that each case lasts two to three days. We've got reasonable rounds, grounds to suggest that that's true. As I said, increased risk of lameness. The odds ratio, 200 0.3%. So herds with a high incidence of a high prevalence of acidosis had a high prevalence of lameness. Now let's have a look at these substrates because I said that substrates influence acidosis risk. This is a study looking at fructose and histidine. And we're looking at the administering those at levels consistent with what cows would obtain from pasture. 
and see whether they increase the risk of subacute acidosis. So these are the groups we used. We used a control group, no grain. We used a grain group, 1.2% of body weight. We used grain plus histidine, grain plus fructose, and obviously grain, fructose, and histidine. What I really want to focus on is really this. There's the grain. That's the ruminal pH with the grain challenge cattle. That's the pH of the animals that were cha challenged with substituting 0.4% of the grain with fructose. You got a marked change in pH. But what was even more striking, given that we'd only found a couple of animals with more than 5 millimoles of lactic acid in the Bramley study, over 800 animals, this was really quite striking. This was the most lactic acid we'd found in any of the studies. The grain challenge study, even though we were taking these animals, basically cold slugging them with large amounts of processed grain, we didn't see any lactic acid to speak of. In fact, this follows the same pattern we saw all the time, which was that the lactic acid was initially high and disappeared. Obviously, there's good reason for these cows to move lactic acid into safe pools and do so rapidly. But the striking difference was the amount of lactic acid generated with the presence of sugar. So the next study we also looked at was to see what the impact of um, doing a longer term study feeding, I guess, sugars and grains would do. So this was an acute challenge study, the last one. Then we've taken them into longer term studies, looking at a 20 day adaptation. And what you can see is as we increased the amount of substrate into these animals, what you started to see was cyclic eating. So there's this marked cyclicity as animals drift in and out of acidotic conditions. And this is why we lose milk volume to some degree. It's actually the animals starting to go off feed, come back on to feed, cyclically adapting to the diet. And it's interesting, a lot of people have described this effect, but you know what? It's actually the first time that I know of anybody's actually been able to demonstrate it and publish it, so a little bit different. Okay, so one of the things that's really quite striking is when we start to look at the microbiomes within those rumens, we also start to find a lot of variation among groups in changes in the microbiomes. And in some cases, we're losing the fibre digesting bacteria and we're getting increases in the starch digesting bacteria, as you would expect. But oddly enough, the group with the biggest changes is the grain plus histidine group, and we saw relatively little um, associated change in anything else with the histidine presence. So, the other thing that I want to say, and this is demonstrated remarkably in a lovely study by Paul Weimer, where he evacuated rumens of two animals, swapped them over, and what you found was that despite thoroughly evacuating and cleaning those rumens, that in a matter of, in one animal a couple of weeks, and in the matter of the other animal in a few more weeks, they had reverted to their same ruminal conditions, even though they had very different ruminal conditions between those two animals to start with. So even though all the bacteria were moved, there's obviously strong communication between the mammalian genome and the metagenome in the rumen. And what you can see here is just marked differences in phylum relative abundance across the different heifers in these groups. And how is that reflected in performance? Well, We'll look at that in just a second, because what we were able to do was show that that metagenome was influenced very much and represented very much by changes in the rumen itself. So what you can see here is the different groups. This is called a co-inertia analysis, where we relate all the animal data and the rumen data back to the metagenome, so the, you know, the genomic construct of these bacteria. And what we can see is that we can see that, in fact, You've got the grain, fructose and histidine group and the grain and fructose here. And what that's pushing is total lactate. So those groups are moving with total lactate. And you can see that the opposite of that is a drop in pH so that you can see that the fructose is really driving that lactate. You can see it's driving butyrate. Over here you can see the grain group being driven by propionate and histamine. And you can see the valerate, the ammonia. So those are the groups, and you can see the control group sitting out here, very, very different to the other groups. Similarly, in the uh, data from Ellen Bank, the study where we uh, fed all those different uh, challenges, what you can see is that the control groups 
very different from the PMR plus protein, again, very different from the PMR group. So you can see the effect of time with those groups, pulling those groups apart much more markedly than the short-term challenge study. So in the short-term challenge study, as you might expect, the bacterial populations tend to stay similar, but in the longer-term studies, they start to pull apart. I'll skip through that. I'll go to the last study, and this is a study where we looked at feed additives. And part of the reason for looking at the feed additives is to understand rumen function. So it's a control, Virginia mycin, menensin plus tylosin, menensin plus a little yeast, and then buffers, sodium bicarbonate, magnesium oxide. And what I really want to show you out of this data is that with these animals adapted in a longer term challenge study, we see remarkable variation within each group in the animal responses to that long term study. So what you can see is the propionate here in the control group. Three of the animals have modest propionate. In other words, they've adapted to the diets. Under challenge, what you can see is a whole bunch of them breaking out. You know, with the Virginia mycin, which is a very strong controlling agent for acidosis, they're really, really very effective. What you can see is that you've got much, much lower propionates in general. But you've still got one animal breaking out. The same with the buffers. Again, you can see the marked variation among the animals within these groups, and the same for the menensin plus tylosin, and the same for the yeast. So what we are seeing is that the message on these is that no intervention is likely to control all the animals within your herd. So there will be animals at risk. It's important to identify the, the prime drivers that cause that. And if we look at those feed additive studies, what we can see is that we've got lactose, lactate, total volatile fatties, fatty acids being driven up with menensin tylosin. We've got valerate, propionate there. You've got pH going down. And again, over into the VM group, you've got marked differences with the responses of these different groups. So in terms of the acidosis pathogenesis and what we've learned from the bacterial work is that this is the classic way that people view acidosis. They think that it's a spiralling effect that's associated with lactobacilli, with strep bovis, and then you get this spiralling rumen pH going down. Our view is that we don't think that's the model at all. The evidence so far doesn't really support that. There's definitely roles for strep bovis. We're not sure that there's any role that we've seen so far for lactobacilli. And what we would say is that that model needs to be strongly reviewed. We don't have a model yet that replace it in terms of the bacterial dynamics, but what we're saying is there's a need for some work there. So, the conclusions. Acidosis is of concern. Perhaps 10% of all cows are subclinically acidosic on a single day, Australia and Ireland, perhaps even more in the US. Substrate determines the risk, the amounts and form of substrate, grain processing, whether you've got sugars, how they're presented. All those things are important. Lush pasture and clovers, wheat, grain cultivars and processing and corn silage can all be risk factors. It is not just grain. It is the fermentability, the effectiveness of the fibre. In TMRs and protein meals, they can reduce the risk. So those are important tools that we have at our disposal. The bacteria involved need to be defined, but there's a possible role for strep bovis. We have a tool to better define and investigate acidosis. Clinical acidosis probably differs from the textbook descriptions. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Are there any questions for Ian before we move on to Temple Grandin? Um, we've probably got about two or three minutes. Just working on One over there, Michael. Please. Andrew. Michael. Uh, Please. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned sugar. And fructose obviously uh, comes from sucrose. Uh, I was at a conference last year where they talked about high starch diets and replacement of starch with sugar and having less of a risk for acidosis than just continuing with the high starch diets. I'd be fascinated to see the data. It'd be fun to look at. Okay. Yeah, have they got data? Yeah, great, great panels. Uh-huh. 
Well, Greg, Greg's a good worker, but, uh, you know, and I'm not sure I'd need to see that paper to probably understand what he's suggesting. It may be part of, the, part of it. There may be a threshold, you know. We're talking about, you know, replacement of one third there. So perhaps that's a little too much and maybe there may be a good space in between. Yeah, and I think if you look at the people who have been consulting in the area, and uh, Mary Beth Hall did a, a survey of those guys, uh, most people are sort of saying 22 to 24 on starch, probably looking at around that um, six to eight sugars. And I think that's probably reasonably sensible. Um, but I think uh, it's really important to focus in on that difference from the physiological perspective. I mean, the data I've showed you is very compelling, um, you know, so... I'd, I'd be interested in that paper of Greg's. I haven't seen that particular one. Thank you, Andrew. Any other questions, please? Um, recent studies uh, on cow lameness seem to suggest that you probably use... Can you repeat, please? Yeah, yeah we're just getting the... Yeah. Thank you. Uh, recent studies uh, with cow lameness seem to suggest that maybe the lameness is more related to body condition rather than, uh, say, the risk of acidosis. Can you comment on that? Well, no, I'm aware of that work. Um, I don't think that it's um, an either or. You know, and quite clearly, if you've got some of that nice work out of, out of Cornell there, showing that there's a change in risk with um, low body condition, you know, you might want to ask the question, you know, where did the low body condition score come from? You know, is it, is it just inherently that those animals were in low body condition score? Or maybe had they had an insult that meant that they're less efficient? And then was that insult uh, an acidotic challenge? I don't know. You know, those are the sorts of things that need to be teased out. But I don't see that as an either-or equation. And I have heard some people making quite strong statements that, you know, laminitis is in the function of acidosis, and I don't think that's right at all. Do you want to come back there? Do you want to come back? We've got a situation in the UK where um, <coughs> dry cows are often fed on <coughs> straw and maize silage, and then they move to a TMR ration based on the same, but uh, including grass silage and, uh, say, soda grain. Um, how long do you think the rumen takes to adapt to that diet? Yeah, pretty typically we're finding that the rumen, the rumen does take about 10 to 14 days to adapt. And it's one of the things about transition is that, you know, you need to make it a transition, not an abrupt change. You know, if you end up with an abrupt change, well, it's not going to be a, a heck of a good item, is it? So it's really about making sure that transition occurs as a, as a series of planned steps to make sure that that rumen is adapted right the way through. Thanks, Ian. Any other questions for Ian? Okay, thank you. Ian, thank you very much indeed. Um,